Thank you and good afternoon everyone. I am Lauren Hayes Knudsen and I'm the environmental clearance officer for HUD's community planning and development programs, including CDBG DR and CDBG MIT. And I'm joined today by Sean Joyner, who is the system administrator for the HUD Environmental Review Online System or HEROES. So today we will cover some basics and best practices for environmental review and disaster recovery. You will learn how to navigate the HERO system and how to um, complete a request for release of funds in the HERO system. So we'll start with some environmental review basics, then cover some requirements and best practices for environmental review following a disaster. Then Sean will cover some heroes basics and the request for release of funds process. We'll flag a few resources that may be helpful for you for environmental review and then get to the Q and a portion. So, we'll start off with some environmental review. Um, first, I'll cover some background on environmental review and the department's requirements. So the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which was passed in 1969, is kind of the umbrella statute for federal requirements for environmental review. Um, and this act created the Council on Environmental Quality, which implements NEPA. And the act requires federal agencies to consider the environmental impact of proposed actions at the earliest point in the planning and decision-making process. So it is a public process that's designed to encourage public participation and requires that environmental review documents be available to the public. Um, and the real purpose behind NEPA is to create transparency in government actions that may affect the human environment, um, including notifying the public and analyzing impacts, as well as considering alternatives. It does not necessarily prohibit environmental impact, but it's more of a procedural requirement. So a look before you leap or stop and think kind of process. Then HUD's Environmental Regulations at 24 CFR Part 50 and Part 58 implement NEPA for the agency. So this is a full list of HUD's environmental regulations. So Part 50, are the environmental review requirements for HUD staff. Um, and part 50 applies to most Office of Housing programs, a few small CPD programs like Veterans Housing Rehab and Modification Program, um, but most HUD programs and certainly the majority of CPD programs are part 58, which are the environmental review requirements for states and local governments, assuming the federal authority to complete the environmental review. Um, so this includes CDBG and disaster recovery programs, and those are all reviewed under part 58, where a state or local government or responsible entity or RE assumes responsibility for environmental requirements. Then part 51 are HUD standards for man-made hazards. So things like noise, explosives or flammable hazards and airport runway clear zones. And then part 55 covers HUD reg HUD's regulations for floodplain management and wetlands. So I've covered kind of the reasoning behind NEPA, but the environmental review for HUD specifically is an analysis of the impacts of a project on the surrounding environment and an analysis of the impact of the environment on end users like residents. The environmental review ensures that HUD funded projects provide decent, safe and sanitary housing. It demonstrates compliance with up to 17 federal environmental laws and authorities. Again, this is a public document, so it needs to be publicly available as a transparent process that encourages public participation. And it is a statutory requirement for all HUD projects, so it's not something that can be waived. So first, an important tip, or rather one of the most important HUD regulations to remember is the limitation on activities at 24 CFR 58. So this requires that neither the HUD grantee or partners or subrecipients and the other stakeholders 
are allowed to commit or spend HUD or non HUD funds on physical or choice limiting actions until the environmental review process is completed. So choice limiting actions are actions that limit the choice of reasonable alternatives or essentially lock the project into a specific location or activity, such as acquiring a property, entering into a contract, starting physical work on a project, um, even with local funds. So the takeaway here is do not spend a dime until the environmental review is complete and you've received an approved request for release of funds from HUD where it is required. Next, I want to cover a couple streamlining measures in HUD's regulations to note for disasters and emergencies in particular. The first is the exemption at 5834A10 for imminent threats. Um, and this is an exemption that allows for temporary or permanent improvements to prevent imminent threats to public safety, including threats from physical deterioration prior to completion of the full environmental review. Um, so this you know, would allow you to take these actions to prevent the impacts of imminent threats um, prior to environmental review. And recovery work in general is not considered emergency in this case. This would be something like a building collapsing into the street where there would be an imminent threat to public safety, um, where you could undertake work only work necessary to prevent this threat, not kind of the full scope of the project. You couldn't then get into additional rehab for the building, um, but you can take these kind of preventative measures without a full environmental review. Then the other regulation to note for emergencies is 58.33, which allows for an expedited public comment period, which saves two weeks for an environmental assessment level of review. Um, so this would be useful if funds are needed on an emergency basis and adhering to these two separate comment periods, so both the public comment period and the 15-day objection period, um, would prevent giving assistance. So to utilize this exemption, responsible entities can publish a combined finding of no significant impact and notice of intent to request release of funds simultaneously with submission of the request release of funds. Um, and this will combine the comment periods um, and the comment period obligations, both for public comment and objection can be met simultaneously over 15 days. Um, to do this, the, the public notice must state that the funds are needed on an emergency basis due to a disaster um, and that commenters should submit comments to both HUD and the responsible entity. And we have a memo on disasters and imminent threats utilizing these exemptions that's linked later on in the presentation that provides additional guidance. Next, I have a couple notes on coordinating with FEMA and some options for streamlining environmental review. So HUD has a provision under certain sections of the Stafford Act that allows grantees to adopt FEMA environmental reviews when the HUD grantee is providing supplemental assistance to actions performed under the Stafford Act. So if there's a FEMA project um, you know, kind of already existing and HUD is providing funds for the same project for the same scope of work, the RE can adopt the existing FEMA environmental review. To adopt the FEMA environmental review, the responsible entity would keep the FEMA review on file and submit the request for release of funds and certification to HUD, after which HUD can immediately issue the authority to use grant funds without waiting the 15-day objection period. Um, this is also true for submission of a ROF for CEST levels of review under the Stafford Act. Um, but you have, if you have questions about adopting a FEMA review, please reach out to your HUD and FEMA environmental officers. Another item in terms of coordinating with FEMA is flexible match. And flexible match allows FEMA public assistance or PA applicants to use available HUD CDBGDR funding in a streamlined manner to fulfill a portion or all of the local match requirements for FEMA's PA program. 
So this allows CDBG DR funding to be applied to distinct facilities or sites within a FEMA PA project instead of a portion of each site. So if you look at this example here, a single project with four sites, typically the DR funds would be applied to you know 25% um, of the project as a whole at each site. But with flexible match where there's four buildings, it's still going to 25%, but it can be at one individual site instead of all four. Um, so in this case, the um, it allows the sites to comply with FEMA PA requirements across the board, but only the CDBG DR assisted portion must comply with the CDBG DR requirements. So this is an option to help streamline overlapping compliance requirements. It can help FEMA and HUD grantees navigate two sets of federal requirements in a more timely way. Okay, next I'll cover some additional requirements for disaster recovery, environmental review, and some best practices. The first is section 106, which are the requirements for historic preservation, um, which is a requirement as part of the environmental review process. Um, but for disasters in, partic in particular, there is an option to add a HUD addendum to an existing FEMA programmatic agreement. So following Hurricane Sandy, HUD proposed a negotiated and innovative use of programmatic agreements or PAs to expedite historic preservation reviews of CDBG DR projects, which built upon previous work by FEMA. Um, so these FEMA programmatic agreements include extensive exemptions, shortened timeframes, expedited resolution of adverse effects. Um, so this there is an option for HUD REs to sign on to a HUD addendum to these existing PAs to also utilize these streamlining measures. Um, FEMA has a prototype PA that includes this provision for federal agencies to adapt the PA and utilize the same procedures. Um, there are several states uh, or current CDBG DR, CDBG DR grantees with HUD addendums to a FEMA PA already in place. And there's no additional responsibility on FEMA's part to include this HUD addendum. So this is a great tool to coordinate and streamline the historic preservation review and compliance process. Um, so again, reach out to your environmental officer if you have questions about adding or using the HUD addendum. Next, I want to note um, a flood insurance requirement known as the one bite rule. And this requirement states that HUD or the state cannot offer federal disaster assistance for a person's property for construction activities where the person previously received federal disaster assistance and failed to maintain flood insurance. Um, so this isn't, you know, a person receiving assistance for the first time and they don't currently have flood insurance. It's a failure to maintain flood insurance after previously receiving federal disaster assistance. Um, so important to remember when considering if there's been a failure to maintain flood insurance, this can jeopardize federal assistance following subsequent disasters. Next is floodplain management. Um, this is another major regulation applicable to disaster recovery. Um, HUD's Floodplain management regulations are at part 55, which implement executive order 11988. Um, so these regulations look at avoidance, minimizing impacts to the floodplain and providing public notice. Um, so it's important to note prohibited actions under part 55. Um, the first is that no funding and no work at all can be done in the floodway. Um, there is an exemption for activities that are functionally dependent uses. So these are things like dams or piers, uh, but otherwise no, no HUD funds can be used in a floodway. Also, um, critical actions or new construction is prohibited in the coastal high hazard area. And critical actions are things like hospitals, residential care facilities, main utility lines, 
where even a slight chance of flooding poses a significant risk um, or may result in loss of life. Um, so those are prohibited in the B zone. Also, any repair or reconstruction of non-critical actions um, that were not designed consistent with the Part 55 requirements are prohibited. Um, then the executive order and Part 55 also require the use of best available information. So this includes using FEMA's flood insurance rate maps to document the floodplain and advisory base flood elevation. And next, just some reminders about elevation requirements. Um, so CDBGDR elevation requirements come into play for new construction and substantial improvement activities. And substantial improvement is any repair, reconstruction, or improvement of a structure where the cost equals or exceeds 50% of the structure's market value before damage. Um, so when the CDBG DR project includes new construction or substantial improvement of structures, they must be elevated to at least two feet above the 100 year floodplain or base flood elevation plus two. Then due to the high risk nature of critical actions, those facilities require elevation of at least three feet above base flood elevation. Um, and then note these requirements do not apply to structures listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, but again, please flag or let your environmental officer know um, if you're looking at historic buildings or buildings that could be listed um, to look at those requirements. Next is a new alternative requirement from the latest Federal Register notice um, for elevation when using CDBG DR funds as non-federal match. So because FEMA funded projects generally commence well in advance of CDBG DR funds being available, um, and when DR funds are used as match for a FEMA project that's underway, there can be, or it can be tricky to align HUD's elevation standards with any alternative standard allowed by FEMA. Um, so this alignment may not be feasible or may not be cost reasonable. Um, so as an alternative, FEMA approved flood standards may be used instead of the CDBG DR elevation requirements when the CDBG DR funds are used as non-federal match for FEMA assistance, the FEMA assisted activity commenced before HUD's obligation of DR funds, and the grantee is determined that elevation or flood proofing costs are not reasonable costs um, based on those the reasonable cost definition in the notice. Next is tiered environmental reviews. Um, and this is a great approach to use for streamlining the environmental review process for single family housing programs. So tiering is a means of making the environmental review process more efficient by eliminating repetitive discussions of the same issues to focus on the actual issues right for decision at each level of environmental review. Um, so this is appropriate when a responsible entity is evaluating a single family housing program with similar activities within a defined geographic area and time frame. So for example, if, if the RE is rehabbing single family homes within a city district or county over the course of one to five years, but where the specific sites and activities are not yet known. Um, so the tiered review consists of both a broad level review and subsequent site specific reviews that are done once those specific sites are identified. So the first stage for tiered reviews is the broad level review. And this should identify and evaluate any issues that can be fully addressed or complied with um, without knowing the exact location or address of the project. Um, so something like, if the, if the rehab program is in a certain county and this county does not have any coastal barriers, then it can, the entire project can be in compliance with the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. Um, in addition, the broad level review must establish standards and processes to be followed for the site-specific reviews. 
Then as individual sites are selected for review, the site specific reviews will evaluate the remaining issues based on the policies established in the broad level review. Then the public notice and request release of funds process are processed only at the broad level, which eliminates the need for publication at the site specific level. However, funds cannot be spent or committed on a site specific activity until the site specific review has been completed for the site. And together, both the broad level review and all the site specific reviews comprise the complete environmental review record for the project. So I gave an example for broad level compliance with coastal barriers, um, but again, compliance at the broad level is possible if the full scope of the project can be determined to comply with an environmental authority. And this can be based on geography or activities involved. Um, so again, if it's a non-coastal county, then you can be in compliance with Coastal Zone Management Act and Coastal Barrier Resources Act for the entire scope of the project. Um, or for activity-based example, single family rehab, that is not doing any new construction or ground disturbance can be in compliance with the executive order for wetlands protection um, because there will not be any ground disturbance that could impact a wetland. Then the site specific reviews are completed as the sites are identified and these reviews are not submitted to HUD, but make sure to keep them on file or upload them to HEROES prior to starting work or committing any funds. Um, and they also must be completed prior to signing any binding contracts for the scope of work um, with homeowners or contractors. Then finally, um, make sure to document both tiers of a tiered environmental review. Make sure that the environmental review record includes supporting documentation, so things like maps and checklists, um, and also make sure that the written strategy defined in the broad level review um, is met by the site specific reviews. So make sure you've completed a full analysis of the factors identified for site specific review with each of these tier two reviews. Um, so it's important to remember that any inconsistencies with the written strategy or any missing supporting documentation can result in monitoring findings. So make sure the records are complete. Finally, I just want to flag a few other best practices um, that can encourage coordination, planning, time savings to help streamline the environmental review process. Um, would definitely recommend looping in state and local environmental departments or using local GIS data if they have that available. Um, they can provide staffing resources or data resources, um, which can be quick, cost-effective ways to gather data for your environmental review. Also, it may be helpful to have a Secretary of the Interior qualified person on staff to complete Section 106 reviews. We also certainly encourage the use of consultants to help prepare the environmental review and analysis. Um, and again, always coordinate as early as possible in the environmental review process. Bring program and environmental staff and subject matter experts together as early as possible and often um, to encourage coordination and time savings. All right, then here's a list of some of the environmental review resources that I mentioned. Um, the first is our main environmental review page on the HUD Exchange. This includes some important tools and resources um, like Section 106 programmatic agreement databases, noise calculator, and there's also a page for disaster recovery and the environment. The next is for HUD environmental contacts. So use this link to identify your regional and field environmental officers. We also have a Part 58 basics webinar and WISER, the web-based instructional system for environmental review with self-paced training modules for Part 58 and Part 50, um, and a environmental assessment factors e-guide 
Um, and I'll flag this last one. It is a brand new resource and it replaces our former EA factor guidance. So if you're working on an environmental assessment, definitely check out this new resource that has a lot of good guidance. And then these are links to some of the memos that I mentioned, so the one on imminent threats, um, a guidance on adopting FEMA reviews, as well as a FEMA and HUD environmental checklist, the flexible match implementation guidance and tiering guidance, including a webinar. Okay, and with that, I will let me pass control over to Sean to get into Heroes. Okay, you should be able to advance slides now, Sean. Just a little Can you see my screen now? The HUD Environmental Review Online System. Uh, so what is HEROES? So for those who are not familiar with this system, HEROES is an online enterprise system which replaces HUD's paper-based reviews that can be used to complete environmental reviews for all of HUD programs, found at 24 CFR Part 50 and 58. HEROES is currently mandatory for all Part 50 reviews. It is a dynamic, it is dynamic based in your question responses and it provides tips and links to resources along the way. We like to refer to it as the TurboTax for environmental review. Uh, HEROES captures the full scope of the environmental review process and allows those procedures to be performed online. HEROES is available for HUD staff, responsible entities, and consultants. There's one caveat for disaster recovery grantees. Uh, is that HEROES is not yet available for states acting as HUD, but if states are acting as REs and directly administering funds, those reviews can be entered into HEROES. There are a lot of great benefits of using the HEROES system. HEROES helps facilitate compliance with NEPA and HUD regulations by incorporating guidance and resources and facilitating communication with partner users and project stakeholders HEROES also streamlines, streamlines the environmental review process by eliminating the need for paper filing because it generates electronic environmental review records that include links to all supporting documentation. HEROES also allows Form 7015-15 and 7015-16 to be submitted and certified online instead of mailing. There are four main user roles within HEROES, although only three of these user roles are currently functional in the system. So then next, I'll walk you through some of the main screens in HEROES and show you what it looks like to enter information in the system. Now first, you would log into HEROES using your assigned BID and password or CID, and we will go over how to register later on in the training. When logging into HEROES, you will select your user profile. If you are a partner or consultant, you would select your partner organization you work for, then select HUD for Part 50 reviews or the responsible entity for Part 58 reviews. And if you are a responsible entity, you would select the responsible entity you work for. When you log into HEROES, you're taken to your HEROES dashboard, which by default shows the reviews that are assigned to you. These are reviews that you have started or reviews that have been assigned to you by another user. You can also select the radio button to show all reviews that you have privileges to view. For an RE, this means uh, reviews that are completed or in progress as part of your grantee organization, you are, uh, uh, but are not assigned to you. You will be able to view these ERs, but you cannot make edits. 
Finally, you can select the go to tiered reviews button to navigate to the tiered reviews dashboard. Uh, please note that we will be issuing guidance to grantees about who to assign the request for release of funds to in the system. Essentially, grantees will be assigning the request for release of funds or RROF to the applicable regional program support specialists. When you start a review in HEROES, this is the initial screen of the review that asks for basic project information like grant number, HUD program, and funding amount, and project costs. Uh, next, you will select the level of review and indicate the project activities. A uh, note that partner users must select a level of review to continue on in the system, but RE users must confirm that this is correct. If you are unsure of the level of review, you can walk through the level of review determination assistant at the bottom of the screen. So next you will select the level of review and indicate the project activities. Note that partner users must select the level of review to continue on in, this, uh, in the system. Um, and the REs must confirm, uh, again, if you are unsure, uh, you can select uh, LORDA. Uh, so these are just a few, I'm sorry for repeating that, but these are just a few uh, examples of what that um, level of review screen uh, will look like. For the laws and authorities analysis, please keep in mind partner users can enter information and supporting documentation into HEROES, but they cannot make final determinations uh, or require mitigation. Only the RE or HUD user, uh, uh, HUD staff person can make these determinations. However, HEROES requires responses to all questions on the screen for allowing document uploads. So partner users like consultants should make advisory recommendations the RE will complete the screens using the feedback. This is an example of uh, what the performing the analysis is and uh, what I just explained will actually look like uh, using the related laws and authorities. So to illustrate this, uh, the, uh, one of these environmental review compliance factors will be selected. And so the partner users, again, they conduct the analysis, support all of the uploading documentation, and the RE user completes the compliance requirements and makes findings and determinations. So here's where the partner would select uh, the radio buttons as appropriate. And as you progress through the screens to make the proper to, to make the appropriate selections, when you get to the end, there's going to be a question that says, "Are formal compliance steps or mitigation required?" For partner users, you will not be able to select the radio dial yes or no. And then this is an this screen is an example for floodplain management where there's a yes and no column and then a justification. If a compliance determination has been made and mitigation is needed. The radio button will change to yes next to the compliance factor. There should also be a corresponding compliance determination, uh, justification, or explanation which led to the decision or finding. Uh, as I mentioned, HEROES packages the environmental review content and supporting documentation into a Word document download of the environmental review record. Uh, and the environmental review record uh, the, that compiles this information will also have um, a, a link to the supporting documentation that has been uploaded for those compliance factors. I also wanted to mention a note on tiered reviews for DR grantees. As DR grantees make the switch to using HEROES, Please note that a DR grantee who completed a broad review outside of HEROES cannot complete the site specific. But reviews that started a quote on paper, they should continue to stay outside the system. We want to avoid situations where ERs are part outside the system and part in the system. So there's no need to retroactively enter completed broad level reviews into HEROES. Uh, next, I'll go over what the request for release of funds process looks like in HEROES. 
grants managed by field offices will need to coordinate with their local CPD rep to determine if they can use heroes. Uh, HQ managed grants have the option to use heroes. So first the RE will make a finding determination. And then this is an example of uh, uh, an environmental assessment uh, level of review where you would print the signature page, upload the signature page and provide the date, uh, provide the necessary fields that have the red asterisk marked next to it. And you'll be able to generate and post the environmental review record. The reviews will be posted for public for the public comment period. Completed reviews are posted on the HUD exchange for one year, standard reviews in five years for tiered reviews. After that, you wait 15 days for the public comment period to end or seven days for a CEST or categorically exempt subject to the related laws and authorities public comment. Following the public comment period, the RE will complete the notice of intent to request for release to fund screen. And you will select the appropriate check boxes saying that it's been published, posted, or if you received any public comments. And next, there are two options for the RE to complete the RROF screen and HEROES to complete the paper 701515 uh, or the RROF or certify the review in HEROES. If a paper a copy has been completed, make sure that the document is attached. The screen must be completed uh, within HEROES. So option one is the paper form. 701515 has been uploaded and attached, and you should be able to see once you've uploaded the attachment that there is a uh, link um, verifying that the, uh, that the document has been uploaded. And then the option number two is the online form where you're selecting the certifying officer will certify the review within HEROES. And then the appropriate screens need to be filled out uh, with the certifying officer um, with, their, with their name um, and, and making sure that all of the information uh, has been completed on these screens in order to proceed as well. So the system will allow you, uh, just as a side note, the system will allow you to complete the uh, review without this section being completed. So please make sure that when you do assign the review and complete this section that all of the uh, dates and the names have been uh, filled in. So following the completion of the RROF screen, the, the RE will assign the review to HUD they should select the checkbox on the HEROES assigned screen, indicating that this is the official submission of the 701515 to HUD. Assigned to your contact in the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division, this would be your program support specialist. A DR grantees must assign the RROF to the applicable program support specialist. Reach out to the assigned grants manager for your PSS contact info. Uh, selecting this checkbox uh, that's that has the orange um, the, the, the the orange circle around it. Uh, th this does set the 15-day objection period, or it begins the 15-day objection period. Following the 15-day objection period, HUD completes the 7015-16 authority to use grant funds. And then you would complete an archive and assign back to the responsible entity so they can make changes if necessary or update any mitigation as needed. The archive button posts the ERR publicly on the HUD exchange and the finish button uh, marks the review complete in the HERO system. Complete an archive, sorry, it's the last screen for completing and archiving the review. So completing and archiving and assigning back to the RE, uh, it, it, this marks the review completed, and then you should be completing HEROES. The next thing to do uh, that I wanna go over is how to register uh, for HEROES access. 
So this form replaces the old email access request process for all RE and partner users. Uh, HUD staff will need to use DIAM's request, which is submitted by your supervisor. For all other HEROES users requesting access, you would select the type of organization you work for. And this would, be, and for a DRSI, this would be your program support specialist. So this would be who is legally responsible for and finalizes your HUD environmental reviews for your organization. And then next we have uh, uh, some great resources for environmental reviews which are uh, available on the HUD exchange, like how-to videos, the HEROES worksheets, and the HEROES Ask a Question or AAQ if you have questions or need technical assistance using HEROES. And also on the HUD exchange is a disaster recovery and environmental page with webinars and completing environmental reviews for CDBGDR grantees. And also on the HUD exchange, uh, that should be your primary resource. Uh, levels of NEPA review is a bit tricky to find. So here's a screenshot. It includes the regulations and sample formats, uh, which are also which you can also find on the HUD exchange as well. And there are some additional screenshots for the laws and the related laws and authorities that you would go to to. Uh, to uh, complete the environmental review on air quality and airport hazards. Uh, so you'll be able to find additional resources by selecting the appropriate um, environmental uh, law and authority as well. And WISER is another great resource, which is the web-based instructional system for environmental reviews uh, to find out more uh, information about the environmental review process, which is a self-paced learning module. And finally, please check or seek the technical assistance from your field environmental officer. There's also a, a, a site on the head exchange, uh, which allows you to see who your REOs and FEOs are. Uh, and also there are available uh, the disaster recover, recovery tools and templates library, uh, where you can find additional resources to help you as well. And this is a list of all of the resources and two tools previously uh, viewed, the CDBGDR uh, uh, grant program on the HUD exchange, CDBG, MIT, and uh, disaster recovery tools and templates library. And now at this time, we will have uh, questions and answers, and I will turn it back over to Calvin. Very good. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Lauren, um, we've gotten um, several questions um, through the Q&A and from the Whova board. Um, and if you all who attended this session have more questions, uh, please ask. We'll, we'll see how many we can get through in our remaining time. Um, I'm going to start with a question from the Whova board. Um, to get us started, and, and I'll direct, I guess, to Sean and Lauren, to you two, to see if you can answer. Um, the question is, are there required certifications for individuals who handle environmental reviews? That's a good question. Um, it, I would say it depends on the kind of work that's being done. Um, there are requirements for certain or there can be requirements for certain aspects of the environmental review for instance if you are doing a project that requires an astm phase one environmental site assessment for contamination um, those can only be completed by qualified professionals um, there is no certification required for the for grantee staff to complete the environmental review but we certainly recommend that they take a HUD Part 58 training, um, you know, to make sure that they have the capacity. Um, then there are also certain specifications required for um, historic preservation reviews. If, if you require the Secretary of Interior standards, um, you know, other 
other qualified professionals may be necessary depending on the project and analysis that's required. Um, so I guess it, it depends on kind of the scope of work, but in general, there's no requirement for grantee staff to complete the environmental review, but there may be for consultants who are contributing to the analysis. Great, thank you. Um, I think now um, I propose we tackle a couple of questions related to the tiering process. Um, and uh, the first one is if our choice limiting actions hinge on the receipt of an approved RROF or AUGF, how does that play out in the tiered reviews, um, particularly where the AUGF has been received for the tier one, but the sites and actions are not yet known? That's a good question. So, right, so normally, you can't do any undertake any choice limiting actions, spend any funds, enter in, into any contracts prior to receiving the AUGF. Um, and for tiered reviews, that is processed at the broad level. Um, so you don't have to, there isn't that requirement, and there aren't those 5822 requirements for the site specific reviews. Um, but those site specific reviews should be completed prior to starting any work at the site specific addresses. Um, it's, it's kind of treated similarly to an exempt or CENST level of review where, again, there are these other, you know, 58.6 requirements. There are environmental review requirements that should be done prior to starting any work, but there is not the request release of funds requirement, um, and kind of the regulatory or statutory violation piece. So I, I'm not sure if that was a clear answer, but in general. <laughs> You, you should do the, the site specific reviews before starting any work, but there's less of a hook in terms of a regulatory violation there. It's treated the same as an exempt review would be. Thank you. Um, I guess we're tiering our tiered questions. Uh, so the next one is, um, so if you have several SFNC, which I think is single family new construction projects within the same county, can you do the broad level first before individual homes for LMI are even identified? So, yes, I mean, if, if you have a defined geographic area and defined project activities, so if it's just going to be new construction, um, in theory, you could do a broad level review and tier those activities. Um, we we generally say that tiering lends itself best to single family rehab. Um, other activities like new construction or multifamily work can be difficult to tier just based on the site differences. Um, you know, it might not end up saving you much time if you can't clear many factors at the broad level. Um, but if you do an analysis and you you know, depending on the geographic area, you are able to clear some factors, um, then yes, you can do the broad level review before identifying the individual sites. Excellent. Um, I'm sort of just picking up on the theme, but um, it is a question recently asked on the board is, how do you do new construction without ground disturbance? You cannot. <laughs> that falls into the category of ground disturbance. There we go. Um, in terms of um, another question um, from the Q&A, is there a difference between a historical place and a historical home? And this is in reference to elevation requirements. Um, those that's a good question. I mean, this, the regulation applies for properties that are listed or eligible to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so these could be places or homes or an area of cultural or historic significance. Um, it, it's a range, it could be a broad category, um, but that is 
determined by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, so generally, buildings that are older than 50 years old could be eligible, um, but you'd have to, or, you know, could be eligible for listing, but you'd have to consult with your State Historic Preservation Officer. Thank you. Um, let's go back to another question that came from the Hoover Community Boardroom, um, which is um, as follows. Um, how to benchmark um, the RE environmental HUD programs within an EPA region, and I guess then the request is to share any lessons learned, share what works, does not work. I guess I'm not sure about the tie-in to EPA regions. I'm not sure. And, I it might just be a broad, a broad um, environmental review question too on best practices. So we can, um, I don't know, I guess I'd say in summary is, is um, Hopefully this presentation is helpful in terms of um, sharing specifics on uh, practices, but but if not, we can circle back to the individual who asked the question on the Hoover board. Um, let's see, this is a question that maybe uh, Sean is directed towards you, but is to say, is HEROES capable of identifying projects that will require uh, LBP, ACM, mold testing based on the age of the home? I think that's a good question. I'm not sure, but I can definitely get back to you. I would add that, I mean, HEROES itself does not, you know, is not really a tool used to identify specific environmental factors that analysis would take place outside the system. Um, but you could document, you know, if you had to do lead-based paint testing, you could document that in the review, either under the contamination section or um, as part of the EA factors. So, you know, any of these can be documented in the system if that testing is required. Excellent. Um, I'm reviewing to see if there are any questions that have not been addressed. And I think um, I've got one that goes back to the um, concept of imminent threats. Um, and so the question I'll read out is, is there a timeline on imminent threats? You know, for example, if there's a project under federal contract and a component of it is known to be causing contamination, and the responsible entity is notified of it and has known for X time and then moves forward sometime later to repair with local funding. How does that fall under imminent threat? That's a good question. There isn't really kind of a hard line with that exemption, but it it is something that needs to be addressed on an emergency basis and something that you know, needs to be addressed more quickly than the time it would take to complete the full environmental review. Um, contamination is an interesting one. I think if, you know, if there's some kind of chemical spill that is posing an imminent threat to residents, then yeah, it could fit that exemption. Um, most likely we see it with like physical deterioration though, like a a building's going to collapse, um, a roof could collapse, um, and then, you know, it, it should be acted on pretty quickly, you know, if it is truly an emergency, um, it can't just kind of sit there. And if there there is a time lag, then there should be enough time to do the full environmental review and you wouldn't necessarily need the exemption. So it does really need to be an emergency. Excellent. Um, and we got one that just came in. Thank you. Keep them coming. Um, in the case of having more than 1,200 SSCs under a broad review, 
Uh, do we make a document that will have all of the SSCs in one? Which would be more acceptable, print or e-file? I assume that's referencing the number of site-specific reviews. Um, and so if you're doing a tiered review in Heroes, um, Sean, do you remember our, the limit for site-specific review uploads? It's currently only a couple hundred, and we're looking to expand that up yes. to a thousand, maybe? You are correct. So it's currently at 600, and we are making the request for it to be expanded up to a thousand. Okay. So, you know, currently you can only upload 600 site-specific reviews in Heroes, and there's a screen to enter information for each of your Site specific reviews, so those are documented separately. Um, but if you go beyond that number, um, you might need to document it elsewhere and do, you know, maybe a separate PDF upload or just keep that on file. Um, otherwise, if you're not using Heroes for a tiered review, um, you could just keep that on file. Just important to make sure to file everything together, the broad level, along with the site specifics. Excellent. And um, I think we have time for one more, um, which is as follows. When conducting a reconstruction or replacement project in the 100-year floodplain, is a BFE plus two feet the minimum standard for elevation? Um, yeah, if it is new construction or substantial improvement, which you know, reconstruction would likely meet that threshold, then yes, the minimum is BFE plus two. Unless it's a critical action, then it's plus three. Excellent. And I think with that and with the eye on time, I'll say the following. Um, if there are additional questions um, or desire to keep the conversation going, then by all means, um, that's what UVA is set up for as well, too. So there's a community board, community room for this session, um, which you can access by, um, by going here. Um, and then um, just... I guess on the next slide, thank you, um, to show the upcoming sessions uh, for today. We've got concurrent sessions, um, resources for managing and monitoring subrecipients, and, and CDBGDR financial management from certification to launch, both of which will be occurring concurrently um, at 5 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, so thank you to our panelists and presenters and thank you for everyone for attending and at this time we are concluding the environment review environmental review and heroes uh, best practices for disaster recovery grantees uh webinar session thank you everyone